Because man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, please take your Bible and open it to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. We will continue our series here in Matthew, going up to Matthew 18 before we go to another section of scripture, at least in my preaching. But Matthew chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. There's a Bible in the chair in front of you, a black hardcover Bible. You can turn to page 870. It goes from page 870 to 871 there in the Pew Bible. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 12. Just a reminder of some of the context in Matthew 15. Matthew 14, Jesus fed 5,000, walked on water. Then the elders confronted him about tradition. Jesus rebuked them, said that the, the thing that's evil is not from outside but inside. Then Jesus went away to a Gentile area. Remember, he talked to a Gentile mother and healed the daughter from de being demonized, healed many people. He fed 4,000 there in Matthew 15. And then he goes right back after his time with the Gentiles. He goes right back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the Jews. And we pick up that story here in Matthew 16, verses 1 through 12. So hear God's word. The Pharisees approached, the Pharisees and Sadducees approached and tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be good weather because the sky is red. And, and in the morning, today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. The disciples reached the other shore and they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus told them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were discussing among themselves, we didn't bring any bread. Aware of this, Jesus said, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves that you, have, that you don't have bread? Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you collected? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many large baskets you collected? Why is it you don't understand that when I told you, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, it wasn't about bread? Then they understood that he had not told them to beware of the leaven in bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is the word of the Lord. May, may the word of Christ dwell richly among us. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you for this word in particular and for this Sunday that we're meditating on these things with what's going on in our lives this week. Father, we pray that this time would be enriching, that you would be our vision as we just sang, that you would break the bread of life because we want to live by your words. So we ask, Father, that you would open our eyes to see your glory. We pray, Lord, that you would speak a specific word of challenge, of rebuke, of correction, of training and righteousness, of teaching and life for everyone here, and that you you'd just change our trajectory of our lives, not only individually, but even corporately as a church family. And we pray, Lord, for even the other churches represented here and even the guests here, even those who aren't Christian, that you would speak your words to them in such a powerful, spirit-filled spirit, uh, way that they would be changed and converted and have faith and repentance. Lord, we can't do any of this without you. We can understand this text a little bit better. We can spend time thinking about what is being said, but we can't grow and bear fruit apart from you. So abide in us, we pray now. Give us your help. In Jesus' name, amen. There have been many COVID debates today about vaccines and masking, and um, there's an underpinning to these debates. The debates are really ranging around the fact that we have rights as people and our freedom and liberty of conscience means that we need to think about what's best for us, for our bodies, especially when we talk about vaccinations, what's best for us, what's best for our bodies. And so there's debates and there's disagreements, not just inside churches, but even outside churches, not just inside churches, but even among pastor councils and elderships about these things, because we need to make sure we take care of our body and we need to make the best judgment call we can and there's all kinds of information in our day, especially with the internet. So we need to make judgment calls about who enters our home, 
how we go to work, what we do at church, the market, restaurants. There's a legitimate debate about these things. And our pastors are actually going to be revisiting this situation soon in regard to the church. But regardless where you stand on the issue, that's not my point this morning. Regardless where you stand on the issue, it illustrates that we rage over the right and freedom to do what we want. And rage is not even a bad word. That we debate and we're concerned over our right and freedom to do what we want and also the right and responsibility to care for others. And those are kind of the two things we're trying to balance. Caring for ourselves, caring for others. And what is best? And so we all must judge as best we can. And so we have a right, we have our own personal rights, there's American rights, and then, then there's also the corporate good. And so there's, there's debates there. But the point here is that we understand as America, I mean, for those of you who are American, some of you aren't, so maybe you're visiting from another country, thank you for being here. We have some members who are not American as well, but for those here in America and American citizens, we understand that there's, you know, that we have certain basic rights. And that's okay, and that's actually all good in some ways, but the, there's a problem with that, not for this debate, but when you apply that to Jesus, when you understand your basic rights and your idea that you need to make the best judgment call you can for yourself, the problem of, with that idea is that we could bring that into the claims of Jesus and the claims of Christian. How do we know the truth about Jesus? Should we trust Jesus or not? Is he trustworthy or is he not? I will be the judge. Let, me, let, let Jesus prove himself to me. Let Christians and the Bible prove themselves to me that this is right and then I will go with it. Now, I'm not telling you to just check your brain at the door and not think. We do need to make judgment calls. God did make us thinking beings. Yet at the same time, it's different when we're, when we're talking about Jesus and our rights. God is our creator. We are his creatures. And therefore, the basic responsibility is to humble ourselves before God, regardless of what we think about what our right is before a holy creator and God. And the Jewish leaders make this kind of, they, they, they embrace this attitude of judgmentalism and the fact that God has to answer to them or Jesus has to answer to them here in this passage. So you look at chapter 16, verse 1, it says, the Pharisees and Sadducees approached and tested Jesus, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. These Pharisees and Sadducees wanted to have Jesus verify if he's the real deal. Is he who he says he is or is he not? Sometimes, if we're honest, if we're thinking about God and Jesus, sometimes we're, if we're honest, we wish we could do the same. We wish we could even just ask God a question, make a demand of Jesus and say, prove yourself to us, Jesus. Even Christians have this impulse. I had this impulse this week. I was seized by fear late at night as I was on my way to sleep. My wife and I were talking in bed, doing what we call pillow talk, just talking about whatever for a little bit of time until one of us gets too tired to talk anymore and then we go to sleep. And as we were talking, I was seized with this fear of, uh, of death and separation from my wife at old age. I had the fear specifically of me being not able to be where she lives and being like in a care home. And then she'd have to visit me every so often and how sad I would be when she's not there. And it was just so captivating and it, it, it really gripped me where I was freaking out almost, like almost like, you know, just in terms of anxiety, thinking about that reality. I'm thinking it's almost inevitable in some ways. I mean, a lot of things can happen, but I was shaken. And I'm sure not everyone is shaken by that fear specifically, right? But you can point to different things that you're scared of. You can point to different things that you're worried about or you're like, will God be good to me in those moments? Can I trust God now while I'm freaking out about the future? There is some threat, some fear that is tempting you or will be tempting you in this season to be unsure about Jesus. Is he good? Can you trust him? What do you do in those moments? How do you, how do you get a grip when you feel like your, your, your heart and mind are out of control and seized by fear or seized by doubt, when you're not sure about Jesus? Can we know the truth about Jesus? What if we're not sure about him? What if we're not sure that he'll actually come through for us in our greatest time of need? Here's the main goal of this sermon. Check yourself when you're not sure about Jesus. So when you're not sure about Jesus, you're seized by fear or seized by doubt, check yourself when you're in those moments. Check yourself when you're not sure about Jesus. And there are three checks that I want you to think about from this passage. In verses 1 through 4, check your demand. In verses 5 through 11, check your faith. And in verse 12, check all teaching. Okay? Check your demand, verses 1 through 4. 
check your faith, verses 5 through 11, and then check all teaching in verse 12. Now, to to break this down, on the first point about check your demand, I'm going to ask three questions. For check your faith, I'm going to ask two questions, uh, two main questions. And then for the last one, check your teaching, I'm going to ask you one main question to kind of unpack that check, okay? So first, let's go to verses 1 through 4. If you're going to check yourself when you're not sure about Jesus, check your demand. And so there's three questions here that I want us to think about. The first question comes from verse 1. And the question is this. Are you testing Jesus? Are you testing Jesus? Look at verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees approached him and tested him. There's the keyword. They tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. So here they are, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're demanding a sign from heaven. What's a sign from heaven? I, I think that they're swinging for the fences here. They want a grand slam home run. They want, they want the biggest, most spectacular miracle that is so undeniable that Jesus must be the truth. That they're, they're, so, they're so skeptical of him that they need something so big that will convince them that he really is the real deal. And if he can't come up with that thing, then what are they going to do? Dismiss him, right? Oppose him and continue to oppose him. So they're looking for something big. And I was thinking, reading through the Old Testament, I was thinking about some of the prophecies. Like, why don't you just come down from heaven, Zechariah 14, and then split the Mount of Olives in two. And then make your way into Jerusalem. Or why don't you just overthrow the whole Roman Empire? The Roman Emperor, all the centuries, all the occupants, all, all the occupancy right here, the Roman occupancy here in Israel. Why don't you just throw it, throw it all over right now? Show that to us. And if you do... Then we're on your side. Just show us some, some, some magnificent sign from heaven that only God can do. That is so miraculous and powerful and undeniable that we would trust you. If he does it, then maybe they'll turn from their skepticism. If he doesn't, then they can use that as evidence. Ah, oh, see, he's not really the Messiah anyways. He can prove it. They were not the first to test Jesus in the book of Matthew. In Matthew 4, Jesus was sent in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit after his baptism, and he was tested by who? Satan. Three times, Satan tested Jesus. Here, the Pharisees test Jesus. If you look at Matthew, just flip through your Bible, Matthew 19. Let's go through Matthew 19. Two more passages in Matthew. Matthew 19, verse 3. Some of the Pharisees approached Jesus to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any ground? So there's a test, a divorce test. In Matthew 22, two more, Matthew 22, 18, perceiving their malicious intent, Jesus said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites, when they say, should we pay taxes to Caesar or to God? So they're testing, and Jesus sees the test there. In Matthew 22, 35, again, um, they ask him, the, it says here, an expert of the law asked the question to test Jesus, teacher, which command of the, in the law is the greatest? Testing Jesus, testing Jesus, testing Jesus, testing Jesus, whether it's Satan, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Pharisees, an expert in the law, people are coming to test Jesus. And they're all following the pattern of Satan, the one who came to test Jesus. This testing of Jesus and his word and God's word goes all the way back, actually beyond Matthew 4, to the Garden of Eden, where Eve and Adam decided to trust the the serpent and test whether God's words were actually true. They actually didn't think God's words were true. And so they ate the fruit almost as a test, a challenge. Let's see if we really die. I don't think we're really going to die. I believe the serpent. We're not going to die. God God just doesn't want us to be like him. They trust the serpent and test God's word. So that's the first thing. That's the first question for you. Do you have a spirit of testing Jesus? Is that what you're doing? Are you testing Jesus? Secondly, are you, have you already made a conclusion about Jesus? So as you test him and ask this, have you already concluded whether Jesus is, is right or wrong for you, if, whether he's good for you or not? Look at verses 2 and 3. Jesus replies to their test, their, their demand, show us a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be good weather because the sky is red, and in the morning... Today, it will be stormy weather or stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. So Jesus faults them here because they're able to read the sky. If the sky is red, then if the sky is red in the, in the morning, see here. Yeah, if, if, um, let me see. Wait, yeah, in the morning, if the sky is red, then it's threatening and they know that bad weather is going to come. 
Because typically, they might think that, well, you know, for a storm coming, uh, the storm traveling from one direction to the other, just typically how weather works, even though we know, even with weather apps, that it's not always predictable. That the, the general pattern is if, it, if the sky is red in the morning, it's going to be bad weather. If the sky is red in the evening, it's because the weather has already passed. The bad weather has already passed. And they could read the sky. You want a sign from heaven? Look at the heavens. Look at the sky. You want a sign from the skies? Well, look at the sky. You're able to read the skies, the colors. You could read the, you could read the weather. You could get a good weather forecast, but you can't read the what in verse 3? The signs of the times. You can't read the signs of the times. After all that Jesus has done, all the miracles he's done in front of them, the demons he's cast out, the thousands and thousands he's fed, the sick that he's healed, his powerful teaching, with all that Jesus is doing, they can't read those signs. With John the Baptist who came before him, drew crowds and their understanding of the Bible, they are better weathermen than Bible men. They know how to read weather better than they, need, they, they know how to read the Bible. And these are Bible teachers. These are religious teachers whose life is to take the book and understand the book and then apply the book to the people. But they can't read the book well. They might know the book, but they can't connect how the book is actually lining up with what's right in front of them. You can grow in Bible knowledge and still be a fool. You can know a lot of theology and still be an idiot spiritually. Unable to connect the dots from what's here to what's here in front of you. And Jesus indicts them for that. He charges them with an inability to read. You can't read the signs of the times. Now, why couldn't they receive um, why couldn't they read the signs of the times? This is not the third question, but still on, on their conclusion, conclusion of Jesus. Why couldn't they read the signs of the times? Jesus' opponents here, are, are um, they're leaning, they already have a conclusion about Jesus. Are they leaning towards Jesus or away from Jesus? Away from Jesus. They're doubting Jesus. They're cynical about Jesus. They're skeptical about Jesus. And because of that, their question might seem like a Hail Mary, kind of like a last dish effort, like give me a big sign that is undeniable. But other than that, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. I don't think you are who you think you are. I think you're a trickster. And your threat to me is not well received. And so because of that, they don't think he is who he is, that he's the Messiah from God or that he has a true message from God. And so they seem open to, the, to Jesus. Um, and they have all the evidence they need to conclude that they should defer to Jesus. Yet they refuse. Because when they say, show us this, what are they saying? I mean... I said they're leaning away from Jesus. Are they 100% sure that Jesus isn't the Messiah? Maybe. I do take their effort. I, I, I want to give them a little bit of, a, of, of, of benefit to their question here. I do want to take it that their question is still at least maybe a last-ditch effort to just show me something. Because if you do show a sign from heaven, maybe, maybe they're honestly thinking that they would actually repent and trust in Jesus. They actually think that they, they would. Now, why, would, why were they unable to read the signs of the times? Because they're leaning away from Jesus and all the signs he's already provided for them. And so the leaning away from Jesus cloudies your vision of Jesus. Your skepticism towards Jesus makes God blurrier in your eyes. It makes you less discerning of the Bible and of reality in front of you. So if that's true of them, why would we be unable to read the signs of the times? Why would we be unclear on who Jesus is and whether we can trust him for the trials of our lives? I'm not speaking of those non-Christians who are increasingly getting clarity because they're seeking Jesus from an honest heart. But for those of us who are perpetually confused about Jesus and say, I don't know. I don't know if I should trust him or not. I'm, the jury's still out on that. For those who are still gen, uh, confused, it might be coming from the fact that you don't really lean towards him. You actually already are concluding, at least tentatively, that he's not true, that he's not good, that he's not the Messiah, that you can't trust him with your life. And so you ask yourself, have you already made a conclusion about Jesus? Are you already leaning away from Jesus as you check your demands of Jesus? My demand, just to put some skin on this, in my trial, my demand is, Lord, guarantee for me that I'm going to be okay when I get older. That's my, that's my guarantee for me that I'm not going to get sick and separated from my wife or that we're going to die in a sudden accident where we don't have to be apart from each other for anything. And none of us will be widowed. Guarantee that for me. That's my sign. So the question is, well, PJ, when you're asking that of God and you're feeling that fear, are you leaning towards Jesus or are you leaning away from Jesus in skepticism that he's just got it out for you and God is just out here to, to make life hard for you? So that's the second question. The third question is this in checking your faith. 
So the first question was, are you testing Jesus? Are you, have you already made a conclusion about Jesus? And the third one from verse 4 is, are you demanding a sign of your own choosing from Jesus? Again, I just told you what my sign was. God, give me a guarantee that I won't have to go through this pain in the future. Are you demanding your own, a sign of your own choosing from Jesus? Look at verse 4. Here's what Jesus says for those who are demanding a sign as you check your own demands. An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. Wow. There's, there's Jesus rebuke to us. PG, are you demanding a sign from me? Pharisees, Sadducees, are you de- demanding a sign from me? Are you demanding a sign from me? An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. An evil and adulterous generation. Did you hear that? Jesus calling those who demand a sign from heaven, from God, a sign of your own choosing from God. Jesus calling, if you have that demand of God, God, you owe me a sign. Give me a sign, and until you do, I won't trust you. God calls that person, their heart what? Evil and adulterous. Evil and adulterous. The evil comes from a self-centeredness. Because the demand is not coming out of my concern for God's glory and the good of other people. My concern is coming out of my own fear, my own anxiety, my own judgment. And when I am self-centered, God is now outside of the center, and now I'm, good, I'm judging God. And that's what evil is. Evil at its core is opposing God. And so by, by virtue of demanding something from God outside of what God wants to give me, my demand and the attitude and the, the vigor of my demand is evil because it's self-centered rather than God-centered. I'm God in that situation, and and now God has to submit himself to me. And then the adulteress, that's that's where evil comes from, the selfishness. What about adulteress? Now, adultery has a clear, there's a clear analogy there, right? Adultery, if you're married, one spouse, uh, husband to wife, and then one of the spouses uh, commits adultery and sexual immorality with another person outside the marriage, that's adultery. Um, Betraying your spouse. And so Jesus is saying, If you demand a sign from me, you're adulterous. What does that mean? I am your God, or God is your God, and for you to leave God for your own demand means that you're pledging your allegiance to another God. You're worshiping another God. In other words, you're being spiritually adulterous. And this is what James is getting at in James 4. Look at James 4, 1 through 4. James, Jesus' little brother, picks up on these themes. Now, listen to the demand that causes fights among people. There's a demand and an evil, and then there's adultery. Look at verses 1 through 3, or listen to verses 1 through 3 of James 4. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you, your desires? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You're being selfish. You're self-centered. And because of that, your passion that's driven by your selfishness for what you want causes you to fight with other people. That is evil. But then verse 4 of James 4. Then James goes on one step further. You adulterous people, not just evil and self-centered, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. When you love the world or the things of this world so much that your allegiance is to the world rather than God, you have another God. That's idolatry. That's spiritual adultery. And so for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and for you and I to demand from Jesus a sign of our own choosing that he must do or else he doesn't deserve my trust is evil and it's adulterous. And only an evil and adulterous generation seeks that sort of sign, Jesus says here. Our desires drive the direction of our lives. Your desires drive direction. Faith faith seeking understanding is a way of thinking about theology. You believing in something and leaning towards it, then you start to understand it more. That doesn't only work towards God. Faith away from Jesus seeks understanding in a different area. Your preferences press on your principles. You think you're driven by theology and principle and just truth? We're driven by our desires. It actually leads us away from or toward the truth. You know, there's this great debate between Gordon Stein and Greg Bonson, at least for those who are in Christian apologetic circles. There's something called the great debate at UC Irvine. 
uh, in the 80s or the 90s, Greg Bonson debated Gordon Stein, this famous atheist uh, scientist guy, and then Greg Bonson, who's a Christian theologian apologist. And Gordon Stein says in the middle of the, de the debate there in the gym, he says, he says to Greg Bonson, make this, uh, if God would cause this podium to rise and float around, I would believe in God right now. You know, that's a challenge to Greg Bonson. Like, yeah. So if this podium just gets up and rises, I'll believe in God right now. If it just starts flying around the room. And Greg Bonson replies and says, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You'd explain it away. As soon as the podium started flying, you'd say, is there a machine under there? Did somebody trick it? You're like, you would, you would look for another explanation for why the podium is rising. You say it's because you would see it if the podium rise. That's maybe an honest thing from your side. But deep down, you're already leaning away from God. That if it rose, you would just say, man, something, I don't know what's, I don't know how to explain it, but something's wrong. Someone is messing with me. And you wouldn't believe in God because our desires drive our direction. And here Jesus says, look, look, reading on in verse 4, Jesus says, so they demand a sign, but what does Jesus say? Does he say yes or no to their request for a sign? Will he give them a sign, yes or no? No sign will be given to you. No sign will be given. Why? Because Jesus will not be coerced, not by Pharisees, not by Sadducees, not by religious teachers, not by Jews, not by Gentiles, not by Christians, not by churches, not by pastors. Jesus will not be coerced. He refuses to give them a sign. Why? Because Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. We need him for our lives. He doesn't need us for his life. He is self-sufficient in himself. He doesn't need us. We need him, and he will not be coerced by us. But Jesus does say in verse 4 that he will give one sign, and what's that sign? The sign of what? The sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Go to chapter 12. Just turn back a few pages, or you can listen to me read it. But Jesus tells us the exact sign of Jonah in Matthew 12, verses 38 to 41. We don't have to speculate. It says in verse 38, the scribe said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. 1239 says, he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Here it is, verse 40. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the son of, the, the son of man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's preaching. And look, something greater than Jonah is here. What's the sign of Jonah for Jesus? He'll die, he'll be buried, and on the third day he will what? Rise from the dead. That's the sign. The death, and really particularly the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead will be the sign. So you want a sign from me? No, I'm not jumping through any of your hoops. But God has a mission for me. And there's a way I'm going to save my people from their sins. I'm going to die on the cross for sinners. I'm going to be buried, and on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. And that's not going to be a sign just for Christians. That's a sign for the world. That will be an indisputable or at least objective outward fact. That You want a sign from heaven? That is going to be the greatest sign from heaven. That is the sign of God from heaven for you. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That is the one sign from God that is public for everyone, Christian, non-Christian, believer, and unbeliever. That's the one sign that God wants communicated to everyone. Jesus died for sinners, and he rose from the dead on the third day. And you know what happens when Jesus rises from the dead on the third day? In Matthew 28, if you just go to the end of the book, when he rises from the dead, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, it doesn't say scribes and Pharisees, some of the elders, the leaders come up with a conspiracy theory to explain a way that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. They pay the soldiers in Matthew 28, 11 through 15 to not say what happened, that you didn't see an angel and the, the stone rolled away, don't say that. Just say that the body was stolen by the disciples. We'll pay you. You won't get in trouble with Rome. Just go and do that. And so the conspiracy theory that arose during Jesus' day, according to Matthew 28, 11 through 15, is that the body was stolen. There's the sign from heaven. Jesus died for sinners, rose from the dead on a Sunday. You have someone who isn't a believer, a Roman, Roman soldier saying, an angel came and told us this and moved it, and they get the sign. They get the angels. There's, the angels are from heaven, right? They get the sign. And do they believe? No. They come up with another theory to buttress their rejection of Jesus that's already been predetermined. Jesus gave them a sign. He would die on the cross and rise from the dead. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is the Son of God. Indeed, he is God the Son. And they wouldn't trust it. If you're not a Christian, here's a question for you. Do you trust the signs that already happened that God's given you? 
particularly this sign, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? It's a historical question. It's not a theological question first. Do you believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead? That historical question changes everything in your life, if you understand it. If you believe he rose from the dead, you got to start asking, what does that mean? That's the sign, and you need to know what it signifies. So do you even trust that the sign happened? And then, second, secondarily, do you trust what it signifies, namely that Jesus is the Savior of the world? If you're a child here, children, a lot of you children believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead because your parents tell you that, and it is in the Bible. We're showing it from the Bible. Our parents, your parents are not making it up. Yet you need to know more than the fact that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead. You need to know what the sign points to, that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the only God who can save you from your sins and give you a life with God both now and forever. If you're not a Christian, God is doing two things for you right now in this message. He's revealing to you how badly you need him to change your heart because your heart just doesn't want him and you can't change your heart. You lean away from Jesus naturally. We all do because we're sinners. And God is telling you, I'm not begging you to come to me. You need me for you to come to me. You need me for you to be changed and saved. So God's revealing that to you. If you're not a Christian, you need God. God doesn't need you. God is calling you to himself. And God's revealing you a second thing to you. He is giving you the one insurmountable proof from heaven that Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus rose from the dead. So if you're not a Christian, let me just clarify the gospel for you briefly. Here's the main message of Christianity. God made you and I, and we are accountable to him, and he is our greatest joy and treasure. God made us to enjoy him and people on this earth forever. But we ruined it because of our sin and our evil and our self-centeredness and our idolatry of other gods and other values besides Jesus. And because of that, we are condemned and damned to hell for our sins forever because we're all sinners. But God sent his son, Jesus, into the world. God sent his son, he, Jesus, God, truly God, truly man, came into this world, died on the, lived the life we should have lived. He died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead if you will repent from your sins and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and treasure. God is calling you right now, if you're not a Christian, to repent from your sins and trust in Jesus today, right now. He's inviting you and calling you and commanding you to come and trust in him. If you're a Christian, I have a question to ask you as I ask myself on the bed in terror, gripped by fear, is God's sign enough for you? Is the resurrection enough for you? Or does God need to do one more thing to really win PJ's trust and your trust? We have needs, we have fears, but is God's sign from heaven, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, is that enough for you? Or, you, or, you, or do you demand more from Jesus before you can trust him with your life? And to the society at large, our message to the world is this. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Lord. And everyone, governors, presidents, kings, all those in society, everyone who's powerful in this world, all of you must bow down and humble yourselves before Jesus because he is Lord. And he doesn't need you. You need him. And that's our message to the world that we keep communicating to them in love and humility ourselves, hopefully. The good news is that Jesus is the sign of God for you. He's the sign of God for you. He's enough that you can know that he's true, real, good, and worthy of your life and allegiance. So check yourself when you're not sure about Jesus by, first of all, checking your demand. Secondly, check your faith. Check your faith. Okay, uh, verses 5 through 11. Now, there's two questions to guide this section of verses 5 through 11. Um, and the questions for you are this. First question for you is this. Where do you go for understanding? Where do you go for understanding? When you're confused, where do you go for understanding? And we, we see this because the disciples fail to understand Jesus. Look at verse 5. So Jesus leaves the Pharisees and Sadducees there with their demands and their evil, adulterous hearts. Jesus leaves them there. He gets on a boat, and he's traveling across the, sh across the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the shore. And the disciples, um, they had forgotten to take bread. They realized that when they went to the other side of the shore. So when, when they're on the boat, according to Mark, when they're on the boat, Jesus told them, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in Mark, it even says the, the leaven of Herod. Watch out for the leaven, the substance in bread that causes bread to not be flat and unleavened, but that permeates the whole bread and makes it puffy. Uh, watch out of the leaven, the bread of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And according to Mark, even of Herod. Watch out for that. 
And the disciples are like, oh, man, we forgot bread. He's talking about bread. We forgot bread. Man, did you bring the bread? I didn't bring the bread. We had all these baskets. You didn't bring the bread? Oh, man. And so they, they start to, they, they fail to understand Jesus. They start to get confused and convicted. We forgot bread. What's our job? I mean, Jesus is teaching and doing all this stuff. He's expending his energy. We're just supposed to be bringing the food. We forgot the food. And so they thought, they thought maybe one of two things. The first one that I think is, maybe they thought when he said leaven of the Pharisees, the bread of the Pharisees, maybe they were thinking, okay, beware of, you know, like Jews are eating kosher, right? They stay away from Gentile foods and things that were touched by Gentiles. Maybe Jesus is just giving them another thing to stay clear of. Don't just beware of Gentile non-kosher food. Whenever it comes from the, the, the Pharisees or Sadducees or it's connected to them, don't eat that bread and don't eat the Gentile stuff. Kind of two, another layer of things to stay away from. Maybe that's what they were thinking because they failed to understand. Or it's because they were so seized by the fact that they didn't bring bread and they felt like failures. They were, they were, they were seized and preoccupied by their mistake that they failed to le- listen carefully. When he, says the, when he says 11 of the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, all they hear is bread and all they're thinking is, we forgot bread. They don't even finish the rest of his sentence. They're not listening carefully to the words of Jesus. It's like those who are trying to impress their teacher at school or their coach or their boss so much that they're not actually focused on the job they're doing. They're focused on the boss they're trying to please. So they're, they're so anxious to do it and their motive is not really on the task at hand that they don't really listen for the words themselves. They're listening to please the boss or to please the teacher. Remember, all these disciples, what do they want in the end when Jesus comes in his kingdom? What do they want? What, what spots do they want? The right and the left. They want the prominence, right? So these disciples are even competing with each other a little bit. Like, we need to be the best disciples. And, and I forgot bread. You forgot bread. And so there's such a performance mentality of earning their spot with Jesus that they're not even listening carefully to the words of Jesus, the full sentence of Jesus. They immediately think about earthly things, material bread, earthly bread, and human concerns. That's what they're thinking of. What, where do, so where do they go for understanding? As soon as they feel confused by Jesus' words, instead of asking Jesus what he meant or even listening and re-listening to the words he said, they go to themselves. This is where they go for understanding. I forgot bread. Did you forget bread? Did you forget bread? We gotta figure out this bread problem. And they feel, all of a sudden, they feel this big burden about bread, and who are they not consulting with their problem? Jesus. They're trying to figure it out on their own. Do you ever do that in your life? You get a problem in your life? Instead of going to Jesus with the problem, you try to figure it out on your own? You look at your own resources, your own connections, your own networks, and you figure it out on your own. So that's the first question is where do you go for understanding? That's in verses 7 and 8. And Jesus says in verse 8, aware of this, Jesus said, you have little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves that you didn't bring any bread? And so my second question, where do you go for understanding? They didn't didn't understand. But secondly, what are you trusting to figure things out? Or who are you trusting? So where do you go for your understanding? I'm going a level below understanding. That's kind of cerebral, right? Intellectual understanding. But below where you go for understanding, who are you trusting to figure things out? Where do you go for what you actually trust to figure things out? They fail to trust in Jesus. What does Jesus call them in verse 8? You of what? You of little faith. Jesus calls them to understand and actively remember what he did, look at verse nine. Don't you understand yet? There's the call to understand. Don't you remember the five loaves that for the 5,000 and how many baskets were collected or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many large baskets were collected? So he's saying, don't you understand? Think, remember, call back actively to your mind what happened, what I did. Is this really about bread? Are you guys really worried that we're gonna starve without bread? I just, we just fed 5,000 men plus women and children and had leftovers. 4,000 men plus women and children, and we had leftovers. Are you guys really so burdened about the bread problem that you're looking to yourselves to figure out how we solve the bread problem? Remember what I told you, you of little faith. Remember what you saw. Remember what I said. Remember who I am. You of little, what? You of little faith. Why were they of little faith? I mean, they saw these things. Why are they of little faith? The answer, one part of the answer is the fact that faith leaks. Faith leaks. 
your spiritual strength leaks. Confidence in Christ leaks. I think of my daughter's bike, or maybe our bike, mine and my daughter's bike that we share, where she has a flat tire, and uh, we have to pump it up every time before we ride it because it just leaks air. Can't just pump it up one day and just ride it for the rest of the week. Nope, we got to pump it up again because the tire is leaking air. In a similar way, your faith leaks. The disciples' faith leaks. Their spiritual strength leaks. And you have a leak, a spiritual leak, that's going to go on until you die. So what does Jesus tell them to do? Remember. 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 Do things in remembrance of him. Remember him. Call him to your mind. The Lord's Supper. Remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. His body given for you. His blood spilled for you in the new covenant. Remember the Lord's resurrection in a Lord's Day gathering with the Lord's people who are going to be on the new earth with you forever. Remember the Lord in daily meditation on scripture. Remember the Lord by journaling and writing down and documenting some of the good things God has done in your life. Remember by posting it on social media. I mean, what good? Social media does all kinds of bad things, right? Use it for some good. Document some of the good things God has done in your life so you can look back and remember God's goodness to you. Share what God has done for you in conversation with others. What God is giving you, what God is teaching you, what God is doing for you. Because you're going to forget. And 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 your faith is going to leak and leak and leak until you are one of little faith. Or God forbid, one of no faith. Remember. Remind yourself of the things of God. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing, Romans 10, 17, hearing the word about Christ. Hearing about Christ. Faith comes by hearing. How do we solve the problem of little faith? What is, what is the problem of little faith? The problem of little faith is not trusting in Jesus Christ. What is little faith? Look at Matthew 6, 30. You're there in your Bible. Just turn back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. And it says here in Matthew 6, verse 30, God clothes the, the, the flowers of the field, the grass. And so Jesus says in Matthew 6, 30, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't God do much more for you, you of little faith? What's the problem of faith here? I don't believe God will do much more for me than he'll do for the grass. There's two, two problems of faith here. Okay, here's the, the twin challenges of faith in Matthew 6. God's power and God's care. Does God actually care about me to meet my need? I don't know if he does. Oh, I'm scared. I'm nervous. I'm fearful because I don't know if God cares for me. I'm doubting his care. Little faith in the care of God. Or, yeah, God cares, but he's too weak. I mean, God could solve some problems, but my problem, this is way too big for God. God can't solve the aging problem. He can't solve the dying problem. He can't solve the whatever problem you're in. God can't solve it. He doesn't have the power to. Oh, you of little faith. Does God care for you? Yes. Does God have the power to help you and to meet your needs? Yes or no? Yes. He gave you a sign from heaven. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You of little faith. Does God care for me? Does God and will God, does God have the power and the desire to meet my needs? One commentator, uh, R.T. France said, faith is a very practical reliance on the care and power of the Father and of Jesus. So the question, you the question we ask ourselves when we're having little faith is, is God able and is God willing? And the answer to both, if you're a Christian, is yes. They should have trusted Jesus for food. They should have trusted Jesus for clarity on his statement about the leaven of the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. They should have trusted Jesus to explain his words and that the words he gave were sufficient for them to have proper understanding in that moment of conversation. Jesus gives enough words that you need to understand who he is. And if you don't get it with his words, you can still ask him. You can commune with him. You can pray to him. They could have asked him because Jesus cares for them and Jesus is able to help them and meet their needs of confusion and little faith. God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? You know, I was feeling my lack of need. I was feeling my lack even this morning. And I had the temptation. Studying this last night, I woke up this morning and thought, Lord, I have been unfaithful 
to devote sufficient time of praying for the church and for this sermon this week. And I wanted to like binge pray, like, Lord, can you shrink one hour into like three hours and can I just do a lot of prayer right now to kind of make up for a week of not praying? And I, I started thinking about all the things I can do to make up for my lack of prayer. And then I just hear Jesus, PJ, you of little faith. Yeah, you failed. So ask for forgiveness. Trust in me. But don't look to yourself and your prayer power to change Bethany Baptist Church. Don't look, for your, don't look to your prayer resolve to give you power in preaching. I care about you. I care about BBC. I'm powerful for you. I'm powerful for BBC. Trust me. Stop looking within yourself and to your own resources to supply you for your needs. Jesus cares for you. Jesus is powerful for you. God is for you. No one can be against you. So God's calling us to rest in Jesus, to trust in Jesus, to know that he's your greatest treasure. Uh, he's, not the, he's not the bread or the immediate need we mistakenly think he is. He is our greatest need. So if you, Jesus doesn't always meet our, what we think is our immediate and greatest need. He will always meet our truly greatest need, which is himself. And here the disciples made the mistake of thinking about material bread, earthly bread. They set their mind on things below rather, rather than things above, as Colossians 3 says. Or like Peter, we're going to read this in the next passage, Matthew 16, or maybe two passages from now, two sermons from now, where Jesus, or Peter tells Jesus, don't go to the cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, you're not putting your mind on God's concerns, but on human concerns. Here they are, the disciples, setting their minds on human concerns. Here I am this morning waking up to preach the word of God to the people of God, and I'm not thinking about God, I'm thinking about human concerns, my prayer life. That's the problem. God is calling us to set our mind on things above, to look to Jesus. And when you live by faith, everything can become, everything is a spiritual issue. Bread is a spiritual issue. Preaching, obviously, is a spiritual issue. Um, worries about your future is a spiritual issue. Worries about future bereavement is a spiritual issue. Worries about your own death is a spiritual issue. Nothing is merely earthly and material anymore. There is no mundane task. Nothing is insignificant or unimportant because Christ is involved in all of it and your whole being is hidden in Christ. If there are, if there were unim, unimportant things, if there are unimportant things in your life that, are, that, are, that don't have to do with God, it's because you're separated from Christ or you're belittling Jesus, you're marginalizing Jesus, you're minimizing Jesus. Food, drink, teachings, Sundays, work days, weekdays, work, rest, home, neighbors, greeting people, all of that has to do with Jesus. All of it. It all has to do with Jesus and God's concerns, not merely human concerns. So, that, so therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God. Or as Paul says in Colossians, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you'll receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. You eat for the Lord Christ. You drink for the Lord Christ. You greet one another for the Lord Christ. Everything is spiritual. Set your mind on things above. If you're not a Christian, I have good news for you. Jesus will care for you and he will provide for you all of your greatest needs if you come to him as your greatest need. If you're a little faither, like these disciples, you have little faith. If you're discouraged because of your weakness in faith, your sin patterns in your life, it feels like you can't get over sin, you feel gripped by temptation and sin in your life, I have good news for you. God is for you, not against you. And it's not because of the amount of your faith that he's for you. It's because your faith is in Jesus who's for you. Jesus is for you. He's not against you. Some of you think that you have little faith, so Jesus will reject you and not care for you until you get your faith up. That's not true. Whether you have little faith in an airplane taking you from L.A. to D.C. or you have a lot of faith. If you're in the plane, the point is not your faith. The point is the, the plane and the pilot, right? It's what your faith is in. Jesus is for you, not against you as you trust in him. And if you think, um, some of you think you'll never, you, um, that you'll never understand God or you'll never understand God's word. But Jesus will help you with, his underst with understanding him as well. He'll help you with trusting him. Jesus is God's provision for you. So check yourself when you're not sure about Jesus. Check your demand of Jesus. Check where your faith is. Do you trust in Jesus? And lastly, check all teaching. 
Now, before we get to verse 12, let's go back to verse 6 for Jesus' command. What was Jesus' command in verse 6? Watch out for what? Watch out for the bread, the leaven of whom? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Watch out for bread. Watch out for leaven. Now, leaven became a symbol for evil generally, but Jesus uses it for good in Matthew 13. The kingdom of God is like leaven. The kingdom of God is spreading throughout the whole earth. So it's not always bad. It does spread. But unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread, was right before the Passover, seven days before the Passover. So leaven, uh, you have to get leaven out of your whole house and everything. There couldn't be leaven anywhere near you during the feast of unleavened bread and Passover. That's why we have unleavened bread for our Lord's Supper. That's what Jesus had. He had unleavened bread during the first Lord's Supper. So leaven became a symbol of the things you need to separate from, the, the evil. And so you should, we should know that there's a, there's a spiritual significance and meaning to leaven. But the disciples, like we already covered, they were thinking about the bread of the Pharisees. And yet that's not what Jesus is talking about. What does he mean when he says leaven of the Pharisees? Look at verse 12. He says, it's not about bread. What is it about in verse 12? Then they understood that he had not told them to beware of the leaven in the bread, but what? The teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees and of Herod, if we want to use Mark as well, and of Herod. The teaching. So leaven starts small and it spreads and takes all over. That's what teaching does. That's what an idea does, right? You get an idea, it's placed in your mind. If that idea gets to water and grow and you start to believe that idea, it changes the trajectory of your life. That's why when I pray every Sunday that God changes the trajectory of your life because we're preaching God's word. There's ideas going out, right? And if that idea grips you, and if you're gripped by an idea, it will change the way you live your life. It starts small. It's just a, it's just a word. I just said a sentence. But a sentence can change somebody's life, right? It starts small. And so if the teaching of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod, if they're saying things and that idea lodges in your mind, that teaching... That has the ability to change the trajectory of your life, what you do with your life, where you go. It's a corrupting force if it's false teaching. Now, there will always be false teaching that we must be aware of. At the core of, now, the Pharisees and Sadducees disagreed on a lot of their teaching. They don't have a lot of common Bible teaching together. Not only that, when you throw the leaven of Herod in this mix, Herod was not even a religious leader. But what do these three have in common? The Pharisees and Sadducees here in Matthew, and then if you throw in Herod from Mark, what do they have in common? At the core, what is this teaching? This teaching is a Jesus-denying or Jesus-marginalizing impulse and disposition. It's a leaning away from Jesus, not a leaning towards Jesus. And in leaning away from Jesus, a skepticism, a cynicism, a Jesus has to answer to me-ism, that pushing Jesus to be under you rather than above you is the teaching at the core, what's common with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and with Herod. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees are trying to be religious, and yet they're denying the God, God's Messiah. Even Herod, he liked John's teaching. He thought John was a holy and righteous man. He loved to hear the teaching, but he did not want to submit himself to that teaching. You can love religion. You can love God, sort of. You can love talking about these things. You could even be a non-religious person who likes Jesus. But if you push Jesus to the side and he's not the center and Lord and treasure and master and savior of your life, then that is the leaven, the teaching, the attitude, the disposition of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod. And you need to be aware of that, not just one time in your life, but all the time in your life. There will always be false teaching that gets us to marginalize Jesus as the Messiah and as the Son of God and as God the Son. In Genesis 3.15, there's a war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. In Deuteronomy 13 and 18, uh, God tells Israel to check for false prophets. Even if they do miracles, if they lead you to another God, you better check them. They better be in line with Moses' teaching and go beyond Moses' teaching in a faithful way. In Ezekiel 34, Ben read Ezekiel 34, 1 through 24. What, what's there? Self-centered, selfish pastors. That's the word shepherds, right? In Ezekiel 34, shepherds. Self-centered shepherds who are fleecing and using the flock of God for their own gain. There are false teachers. There are false shepherds. There are, there are false pastors. There are false, false religious teachers. There is false teaching out there. During Jesus' time, it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod and the Herodians and the Zealots. In the book of Acts, it's the Judaizers who try to mix Old Covenant Jewish and tradition with the New Covenant realities in Christ. There's another false teaching that marginalizes Jesus in the book of Acts, or at least that Acts pushes against, which is Jesus is safe and Jesus only wants you to be safe. That's not true. 
Jesus wants you to be, he wants to be Lord of your life and even push you into danger sometimes. In the books of, in the, the New Testament letters, there's sexual immorality in Corinth. There's whether Jesus was truly human and flesh in 1 John. There's worldly philosophies being mixed with Christianity in Colossians. There's profession without practice in the book of James, in the book of Revelation. It's how do you navigate the difficulties of this world and still be a Christian by mixing them together and even compromise Jesus just a little bit. Just compromise Jesus a little bit. Yeah, don't put Jesus all the way out to the side of your life. Just put him number two. Number two is not bad. I mean, not everyone could be number one. At least Jesus is number two in my life, right? Leaven of the Pharisees. At least, at least Jesus is second in my life to, to my family, to my money, to my health, to my children, to my career, to my power, to my ambition, to my church. At least he's second. That's, that's pretty good, right? No, that's evil. That's adulterous. That's the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod. And that spirit can come up on all of us. So we must always be watchful. We must always be weary and wary and aware and vigilant. So instead of taking the teaching of the Pharisees, whose teaching should we take? The teaching of who? Of Jesus, right? God's word. We should, not, we should be aware of the bread of the Pharisees, but man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, on the Bible, on God's word. We should trust the teaching of Jesus. Why? Faith fuels, faith in Jesus fuels, feeds, and feeds off of doctrinal watchfulness. Why should you watch your teaching? Why should you watch doctrine? Because that doctrine guards you. But how do you watch the doctrine? By trusting in Jesus. Trusting in Jesus fuels your doctrine. It, it feeds your doctrine. And then it feeds off of your doctrine to keep growing you. So there's a faith doctrinal um, situation here. Jesus is here talking about teaching, meaning getting the doctrine right. But faith feeds that teaching and feeds off of that teaching into your life. Doctrine by itself is not enough. There must be a vibrant faith in not just the doctrine, but the God whom the doctrine points to, namely Jesus Christ. So trust Jesus as a means. So, so trusting in Jesus is the way to guard the truth and to beware of the teaching of the Pharisees. Now, the way forward, how do we guard against false teaching in this church? Let's do book burnings and censorships. No, that's not the way to do it. You don't censor people, cancel people. Let's cancel people. Let's censor people. Let's burn books. Let's have a, a, a blacklist of things to not, websites to avoid, books to not read. You could do that. But censorship is not discipleship. Censor, censorship is not discernment. Censorship is not delighting in Jesus as Lord, Savior, truth, treasure, and teacher. I'm not saying indulge in dumb teaching, but as if you're going to guard against it, the main thing is not to fear it, but to focus on doctrinal truth, focus on Jesus himself. So church family, how does it apply to us as a church? If you're one of the 118 members of BBC, here's how it applies to us. There is a growing biblical illiteracy in our culture today. Christians don't know their Bibles, and Christians don't know theology Grant Osborne wrote, many churches hardly open the word and probably the majority of pastors rarely dig deeply into biblical truth. So hold your pastors accountable. Hold your church accountable. But read your Bible. Read your Bible. Worship Jesus by reading your Bible. Don't begrudge a one-hour sermon. I don't know. You guys don't begrudge it, but, but continue to not begrudge a one-hour sermon. Why? We, we need to know the Bible. We need to take time to, to, to know the Bible. And we must fight for this as a church together, knowing the biblical truth, knowing our confession of faith. In all these things, we want to teach Jesus. If you're not a Christian, let me encourage you. If you're testing Jesus, you're not sure about Jesus. If you're doubting Jesus, let me encourage you with a counter doubt. Also doubt your other teachers. Your teachers who are teaching you away from Jesus, the, the things you believe that make Jesus implausible and unbelievable to you, I want you to test that with at least as much rigor as you test Jesus. I'd actually say more because Jesus is your creator but at least test it to the degree that you're testing Jesus and his claims. Because if you get Jesus wrong, that has eternal consequences. The good news is that Jesus is the truth for you. He's the teacher for you, and he's the guardian of truth for you. So check yourself when, Jesus, when, you're, when you're not sure about Jesus. When you're doubting Jesus, check your demands. Check for idolatry and self-exaltation, self-centeredness. Check your faith. Do you know that Jesus is for you, not against you? And then check your teaching. Keep Jesus central. 
Keep communing with Jesus. Keep reading your Bible and, and communing with the church together. I'm calling you, brothers and sisters, to lean into Jesus and then lean on Jesus. When you're not sure about Jesus, don't lean away from him and isolate yourself from him. Lean into Jesus, even if you don't get it yet. Lord, help me. Help me. I need you. Strengthen me. Change me. Explain this to me. Give me understanding. Lord, lean into Jesus and then lean on Jesus. And he will guide you and he will hold you fast to the end. We're called to discern. In this passage, we're called to discern the truth, trust the truth, and hold to the truth. Yet instead of us discerning, trusting, and holding to the truth, what are we? We're demanding, we're doubting, and we're deceived. And when you're doubting and deceived and demanding, there's a blindness on your life, right? And when you walk around blind, what, do you do? what happens to you eventually? You get what? If you walk around blind trying to get to a destination, what are you going to get? You're going to get lost. You're going to go astray, and you're going to get lost. All of us get lost, and all of us go astray. And that's what the Bible says. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have wandered into our own way in demanding and doubting and being deceived. We are lost and stray on our own. And you know what we deserve for straying from Jesus? You know what we deserve for straying from God? We deserve to stay astray. We deserve to be far away from God in darkness forever. That's what we deserve. We deserve to be exiled in our doubts, in our deception, and in our idolatrous demands. But you know what? Jesus was exiled for us. In Leviticus 16, he's the scapegoat. On the Day of Atonement, the priest would put his hands on this goat that's not going to die, not going to be killed. He put his hands on this goat and it says in, in Leviticus 16.20, when he has finished making atonement at the most holy place, the priest is to present the live male goat. Aaron will lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all of the Israelites' iniquities and rebellious acts, all their sins. He is to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry all their iniquities into a desolate land. And the man will release it there, exiled in a desolate, dark, and damned distance from God himself and God's people. That's what the scapegoat gets, because all the sins are on him. And Jesus on the cross says, we all like sheep went astray, we all went to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the what? The iniquity of us all. God put your doubt on Jesus. He put your deception on Jesus. He put your demanding, idolatrous, selfish heart on Jesus and exiled him as he hung on the cross in darkness, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken for you. He was forsaken for me. And then he rose from the dead. That's the sign we get, right? That we can trust in this Jesus. We can take our doubts to Jesus. We can take our demands to Jesus. And we can come to him for forgiveness. I can come to him with my doubts about my future, about aging and death and bereavement. I can take it to Jesus and I can look at the resurrection and know that he will walk with me moment by moment through my fears. Brothers and sisters, let us not be seized by doubt or fear of what we cannot control. Let's look to the resurrected Christ who controls all of it. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you take these words and hide it in our hearts that we would not sin against you. Forgive us for demanding from you signs as if you owe us something. Forgive us for our evil and adulterous hearts. Forgive us, Lord, for doubting you and having little faith. When you've given us your words, you've given us past actions, you've been so merciful to us every single day and we just forget and forget and forget and forget. And forgive us, Lord, for not guarding your truth, not being vigilant over the truth of your words, and being vigilant over a heart that, that leans away from you, that puts you second instead of first. Change us, Lord. Draw us near to you, we pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for us, for being the scapegoat for us, for being lost in the wilderness for us, that we might live with you and live in your presence forever. Encourage us now as we encourage each other with our takeaways. In Jesus' name, amen.